begin, I would just love to say a huge thank you to Laura, Amanda, Melissa, Katerina, everybody that has been part of this wonderful, wonderful organisation and wonderful day. I'm truly honoured to be here today with you to speak. As a sculptor for 25 years, I have basically found my way through my sight loss. I'm also an ambassador for Retina UK. They're a charity in the UK that advocate and support those with retinal inherited diseases and also fund the new research that is up and coming. Um, but above everything else, as well as me wanting to share my work with you, I want to share myself with you. I want you to gain something from my experience. It's been a long journey, a hell of a journey, um, but most certainly the biggest gift I found was within three and a half years ago. I'll go into that a little bit later on, but thank you very much for, for listening. So the early years, the early years for me uh, was when I was diagnosed when I was 19. Um, a very pivotal point in, in your life because you've got your whole world right there as a youngster for everybody to, to uphold and think, wow, okay, I'm going to go into my life now. Um, so as you can imagine, I was at art college studying graphic design. Not something that I ended up wanting to do because I found a passion for sculpture a little bit before that. I got onto a figurative sculpture degree, which was a very, very prestigious degree. There was literally only 28 places in Europe, and I was one of those people that got an unconditional place. And then the diagnosis came along, and it shattered my world. It really did. I didn't know what RP was. I certainly had no idea what would happen to me, that it would be progressive. And I really didn't know what my future would hold anymore. So unfortunately, I went to university for a very short amount of time because it became very apparent to me that I was gonna literally not be able to do it in an independent, mobile way on my own. As a young person with no formal training, with sight loss, I was really out of my depth. So I had to come home and lick my wounds, unfortunately. I came home and fell into what would some would call a depression. I call it my dark days. And I had to really reevaluate my whole life. And that's the point I want to say to you right now. That's exactly what sight loss is. It's the word loss. It's the word grief we do lose an incredible part of ourselves when we get that diagnosis. We think that we are somehow second-rate citizens. We are disabled. We won't be able to thrive. And you can lose your confidence and your self-worth and really not feel good enough. And that was literally what happened to me. But there's only so long that you can stay in a dark place and... Thankfully, I have a wonderful connection to my creativity, and that's my sculpture. And really, my sculpture saved me. Initially, sculpture for me was about therapeutic reasons, no other, really. I started sculpting to try to bring myself out of that dark time and enjoyed it immensely and, and it showed me, although, okay, I didn't go to university, I still had those skills right here in these two hands. So therefore, I started sculpting in a much more serious way. I put my work into local galleries and then the word of mouth soon spread and before I knew it, I was having commissions on a very regular basis to the point where I had to set myself up as a freelance artist and literally that was my job, which I'm extremely thankful for. Um, things for me started to hot up, really, because I had a career as a teacher. Um, unfortunately, I had to leave that career a little bit earlier than maybe I would have liked, but it did give me the opportunity to share that creativity and share it with other people in a more diverse manner. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna 
fully fly into uh, my sculptural career. And within that, it's been the best thing I could have ever done, really. It's, it's shared myself through my work, and my work is, is an extension of myself. My work is symbolic, and most certainly as the site has progressed over the years, it has become more symbolic. The Royal uh, British Society of Sculptors has explained it to actually be improved since the days when I had more vision to now where I am today. Where I am today is actually between 3 and 5% vision residual um, at night and completely night blind. So that was quite an honour to be described as uh, actually you know, a stylistic artist that, that's improved with sight loss. So uh, that, was, that was good. Here's some examples of work uh, just up on the, the screen behind me. Um, we have a piece there that's a four foot eight wing. And then there's a piece called Soul Searcher, which is the one on the right. All of my work is wood. Um, I've worked in other mediums but I always end up returning to wood because it's such a beautiful, tactile, rich medium to work with. Some more work in, up there. There's a piece called Devotion, which is depicting a couple holding one another. And then there's a piece that depicts uh, some lilies, some canna lilies, which was a commission not so long ago. So when I decided about six years ago, after realising that I had this wonderful, successful career as a commissioned-based artist, but not as an exhibiting artist, and of course, me being me, okay, I, wanna, I, want, I would like to delve more into that. So I went into it in a very serious way. I hid, well, hid myself away in my studio for at least 14 months to create my very first collection of 14 pieces. I've self-curated many, many of my exhibitions over the years, and thankfully, they have been so successful. I've been very, very blessed in that way. And as David mentioned, uh, I had an exhibition in 2015, which is at the House of Commons. That came off of the back of being invited by my MP. He came to one of my exhibitions and was very impressed, so he balloted for me to have this exhibition in the upper waiting hall in the House of Commons. That exhibition actually was the very one that rocketed my career. And from then onwards, it's just gone from strength to strength. But one of the most important exhibitions, I'm not going to stand here and bore you all about the exhibitions I've done, there's, there's too many. But there is one I really want to highlight above all else. And that is my Blind, A Sixth Sense exhibition. All about the very thing of sharing my blindness. Now, I came up with this very concept. It's never been done in the UK before in a visual arts manner. I did six sculpted pieces. Each piece depicted a sense. I then placed these six pieces into a completely pitch black gallery space and invited the public to interpret that work using only their other senses. That was a really interesting thing within itself, and it brought up a lot for people in, in, on an emotional level, on an independence level. There were three reasons why I wanted to do this. I wanted to share my newfound acceptance within my blindness, because it wasn't until about three and a half years ago that I actually got to that point with my own blindness. I'll go into that a little bit later on. The second reason was to invite the public to use all of their senses. I feel we live in such a visually orientated world and people gain all of their information just by looking. And I think that's so sad because you're missing so much if you feel that all you've got is your sight. And that's what the gift of blindness has given me. It's given me my sculpture, which is my hands, my hearing, which is supersonic, and it's my sense of smell and taste. And it, it it's such an explosive experience if you allow yourself to really engage with all of your senses. The exhibition was the biggest success I could have hoped for. It's actually being uh, reviewed as we speak at the 
Turner Contemporary, which is a national gallery, and they're hoping to uh, review that so that it go, you know, goes into the program in 2020-21. So fingers crossed there. It made £1,400. It sold out on every piece of work. But above all else, it had such beautiful meaning because for the first time in my life, I was standing up in front of my work. I wasn't putting my work before myself. I was, I was actually standing up and saying, hey, this isn't about my work. This is about my, my life, my experience. And it truly was beautiful. These are the pieces that I exhibited. So on the top left there, we've got sight. That is depicted by an eye. And then the next one was smell, which was depicted by a magnolia for its beautiful scent. Then we had sound, something quite indulgent for me because I'm a musician and I play guitar. So I thought this is a great opportunity for me to create my own electric guitar. So this guitar actually does work as well as being incredibly sculptural. So that was really pleasant as well for me. Um, and then we have a garlic that was depicting taste for obvious reasons, incredibly strong taste. Then we had touch, that's two hands holding a rose quartz. And the final one, which I call a sixth sense, and I'll go into that very shortly, is freedom, is freedom and acceptance, freedom and trust within myself. And I just couldn't think of any better way to depict freedom than than to fly, so that's why I created the dove. Mind, body, and spirit. My journey with acceptance started about three and a half years ago. My career has gone incredibly well, and I'm so, so blessed for that. But it, it really was apparent to me that I still wasn't happy within myself. I still didn't feel I was good enough. I didn't have much self-worth. So therefore, I needed to gain that somehow. I met the most wonderful lady who's a holistic counsellor. She's given me my life back, to be quite honest, because she's given me the gift of my spiritual connection to myself. And I think that's the most important thing for me because it, it really opened me up to all possibilities. She made me realise there are so many beautiful facets to each and every one of us. We all have beauty within us, regardless of what our adversities are, regardless of what ever disability, sight loss we may have. We are good enough, ladies and gentlemen. If you're somebody right now thinking you're not good enough, stop that. You are good enough. You need to believe that yourself. I also appreciate that's your own journey. But for me, it, it just made me realise that my life was right there for the taking if I chose to work on it. One of those things that we work on is mindfulness. It's an incredible tool to bring you into the very moment. People like us, we tend to project into the future because we have a progressive disease. We're always fearing what's gonna happen at, you know, in a week's time, in a month's time, in a year's time. What's gonna happen when we lose our sight? But while you're sitting there doing that and worrying about that, you're missing the now. You're missing the beauty of, of your life right here, right now, and what you have right now in this moment, in this present time. And since learning that skill, it's a constant challenge to keep bringing it back and making sure that I do stay as mindful as I can. But I really do suggest if you're somebody like me that does project Try a little bit of mindfulness because it really is a great tool. So this is the one that's the, the biggie, embracing the cane. Um, for me, RP has been an incredible way of hiding oneself. By that I mean from diagnosis to probably about three, three and a half years ago, I didn't want anybody to really know that I was losing my sight. And I didn't want the judgment, I didn't want the stigma, and I didn't want to be labelled. So I didn't really tell many people. And of course, with RP, we don't look like there's particularly anything wrong with our vision, so you can get away with a lot. But then it starts looking a bit strange when people think you're drunk and you're not actually drunk. 
<laughs> so um, I think it come to that point where I realised I needed to keep myself safe. I had a rather bad accident where I fell down a six-foot culvert. And as you can imagine, it took me three months to return to normal from that because I actually seriously hurt my right knee. Uh, I actually tore the ligament. But that did me a favour because it gave me three months to reflect and soul search to the point where I needed to realise I needed to keep myself safe. So that's exactly what I did. I contacted initially my guide dogs association thinking that would be a route that I would go down. It became very apparent that I've got the most beautiful little Westie dog, but there was no way he was going to allow another dog into our house. <laughs> so um, I really had no choice but to, to embrace the cane, as I say. I was given a cane when I was first diagnosed and uh, put onto a rehabilitation course by the KAB. The course was wonderful, the lady was wonderful and very, very diverse in the way that, that she identified my needs and fitted her teaching to me, which was good. But she did leave me with a symbol cane and expected me to use it. But I will say they make a wonderful stick for your rubber plant in the front room. <laughs> Um, but uh, lo and behold, uh, you know, there are other sticks available, but uh, I do not certainly do that anymore. Um, once I'd started using the cane, in my most blindest situation, because like I say, at night for me, completely blind, that was the best part of actually training with that cane, is because it took me into my blindest. It took me into my, my fear zone. And as soon as I was catapulted into my fear zone and then was able to keep myself safe with that inner belief and that ultimate trust in myself through my cane without tripping, falling, getting back to my home in a one final one piece, that was it. I knew whatever happens to me from here on, I'm going to be okay. And that was a revelation because believe you me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I feel quite sure many of you feel this way. When you're told you're going to go blind, you think your world is over. And I thought my world was over. And yes, I did make an incredible change and a good turnaround with my career. But ladies and gentlemen, we're not all depicted by our careers. Yes, it's important, but equally important is our own wholehearted well-being. And for the first time in my life, I 100% believe that when I do lose all of that residual vision, it's not going to make a difference. And I believe it so much that uh, I dressed up like a Jedi. <laughs> so once I accepted my blindness, and I was at peace, if you like, with my situation. I realised that there was no reason to, to, to really limit myself with my life. This presentation today I entitled Positive Mindset, Limitless Life, and I truly wholeheartedly believe that. I believe as soon as you have that inner connection and that positive mindset, you can achieve anything. <laughs> You are unstoppable. You are as equal as the person you sit next to. And really revel in your greatness. Um, for me, it's all about board sports as a hobby. As you saw a little bit earlier on when I walked on there with the music, uh, there was a, a video playing of me surfing. Surfing to me, again, very much like mindfulness. I didn't learn to surf until about four years ago. I was registered blind 2002. So as you can imagine, a lot of people would think, wow, you, you're blind and, and, and you're going to learn to surf. Are you mad? But honestly, I, I suggest you try it because it's one of the most freeing things that I've ever done. You have no obstacles in the water. And to be driven along with Mother Nature, being part of the elements is, is something that's quite incredible. And uh, I think since my husband taught me, he, he's nicknamed me the, uh, the surf Nazi of the family because I constantly want to surf and uh, I think sometimes I can get a bit, a bit taxing. <laughs> I also am a skateboarder. Again, it's a, it's a 
a board sport born basically from the culture of surfing. And it, again, is very, very free in experience. I use my cane in my left hand to navigate my way. Quite often go out along the canal. I, th I think sometimes I get a few unusual looks and um, people actually do ask me, what is that you're holding there? So uh, I always take that opportunity to actually educate people because that's what it's all about, <laughs> educating people and making people understand what, what it is you're about. Today I've walked on with a black cane. I've got a purple cane, I've got a, the, the generic white cane, I've created my own bamboo cane. That's another big thing. People identify the blind with either a white cane or a dog, and there's no in between. And yeah, especially young people that are diagnosed may not necessarily want a white cane might want to be a little bit more trendy, a little bit cooler, and have, you know, an unusual colour. And I say, why not? Absolutely, why not? But if we're going to do that, we need to educate the public that that's actually what it is. It's a mobility cane. And hopefully by skating with my purple cane, that's what I'm doing. Um, there's also a picture there of me zooming down my drive when we had the, the snow last year. I uh, unfortunately... Uh, made my husband take, take the, the wheels off of his longboard skateboard so I could steal it and use it as a snowboard. <laughs> With that, I actually diversify my sculptural skills and I now create bespoke wood deck skateboards. They go by the name of Blinded Soul. And actually, they're doing really well and they are kind of taking off all over. I've just recently put one out into into a very, very uh, inspirational man called Dan Mancina. He's an American, and he also has RP, and I created him a board, and he's the most... I suggest you look him up, actually, because he, he does some absolute crazy things on a skateboard, and people don't actually believe that he's blind. So, again, another trailblazer, as they would say. Another interest of mine is music. I've been involved with music for about 23 years now. I'm a singer mainly, but I do play piano and I write my own music and I do play guitar. I've been in and out of bands for many, many years and music for me is another creative process that just completely connects me to my inner self and is an extremely beautiful thing to experience as well. Travel's been a big part of my life. Early 20s, I had a different mindset, obviously, back then. I thought to myself, I want to see the world before I, before I go blind. So I donned a backpack, and I went all around Canada, all around Australia, America, Mexico. It was incredible. I got the bug, and I just kept doing that for a good sort of two, three years of my life. Now, you may be thinking, you know, how can I go travelling? I can't see. What am I going to gain from that? I still travel. Me and my husband still travel. And it's a big part of our lives because it's not just about what you see. It's about the experience of being in another country, feeling other people's cultures, meeting people, the food, everything. There's so much more to explore than just the sightseeing part of, of travel. So here's the part I'm going to tell you and I'm really very strong about is the supportive network that you surround yourselves with. Retina UK, again, just like FB Island, are working really hard to support people with sight loss. And I think that's the thing. It's the word support. Family, of course, keep your family network around you. I've got a very strong family. My greatest support is my husband. He's my rock. He, he helps me in every way. And also, he's an incredible positive person. And sometimes, when I'm not so positive, it will help me get back up to speed with it. So, you know, I'm very lucky in that respect. I've also got, obviously, my holistic counsellor, who I check in with all the time. Literally saw her last week. And we still work on on self-improvement and self-development. But having a supportive network, be it charities, organisations, or be it more personal, family, husbands, etc., wives, 
whatever it is works for you is really, really imperative to your journey. So the three A's. First step for me was acceptance. That sounds like a really, like I'm just being really quite nonchalant. I'm not. It took me 23 years to get to that point. I don't want people to take that long to get to that point. I want people to arrive to that point a lot sooner than I did because at the end of the day, we all have a beautiful life and it is beautiful, it's tough, it's challenging and we all have our crosses to bear. But at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to try and lift ourselves and make the most of what we have. So accepting my blindness, realising that I could keep myself safe even when I can't see, that was the first step. That then opened up adaptivity. An adaptive mind is absolutely key to being able to live a fulfilled and engaging life. So be as adaptive as you can be. Be a solution finder. If there's not a solution for something out there that you want to do, then find it. Do, be different. Dare to be different. It's great to be different and revel in it. That's how then accessibility will then come in because the environment for which we live needs a lot of improvement, yes, but it's our responsibility to spread that word so that our governments and our states can start making our world and our environment a much more accessible place. Changing the perception of blind and real community. And my last and final word for the, for the day is let's change that very limiting belief of what blind and visually impaired people are. We are not people that sit in a corner on a, on a chair, not wanting to participate in life. We are people that are empowering. We are people that have beautiful gifts in each and every one of us. And why should we not want to celebrate that? I think it's important to celebrate all of the talented, wonderful people there are within the visually impaired and blind community. And I'm sure, as I'm speaking to a lot of you today, I feel very, very sure that each and every one of you with a visual impairment has a beautiful gift inside you too. So finally, I'm reaching out. I'm mentoring people that are newly diagnosed with RP and also different sight loss conditions. That's where I want to fill the void because when I was 19, 24 years ago, there wasn't anybody for me to reach to. There wasn't somebody a little quirky and, you know, not that I'm quirky, but there wasn't anybody that was willing to take me under their wing. So basically, now I've reached my, my acceptance and I've travelled this beautiful path of blindness, I want to reach out to you I want to offer up my support in whatever way I can. Now, that includes through my ambassadorship with Retina UK. That also includes now a lovely working relationship with FBI Ireland. It also includes my public speaking. So I'm here for the rest of the day. If you feel that you're one of those people, maybe you're struggling with your sight loss, come and find me. We can talk. I can give you all my details. You can go on my website, www.victoriaclairesculpture.com. Go onto the contacts page where you will find all my details. Feel free to contact me at any time. And thank you so much for your time.